Hello, everyone, and welcome to our second installment of the LBGTQ Plus Conversations. Today, my guests are Raleigh Zakowitz, founder and owner of Bassi Pilates, and my special, special guest is Ellsworth Howard, who's going to be joining us as well. Rail, I just have to once again commend you for us giving us this platform. And I know it's been a lot putting it all together, especially with your whirlwind tour. But I appreciate your time. And for people that are new, can you just give us insight on how we got to this place? Sure. Um, thank you, Stella. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, with all the teaching engagements and commitments I have, this is so special to me. I, I, I do not want to give up on these great conversations. And really, conversations in commonality evolved because we were having these conversations anyway. And I just wanted to open the window. Mm -hmm. I wanted to open the door. I wanted to pull the, uh, the blinds apart, the curtains open, <laughs> and say to people, come on in and have these conversations with us. These are conversations that, that go on in our home, in our studio, and I wanted everyone to take part. But I want to add to that without taking too much time. There's more need than ever. There is more need than ever. To be silent is to be complicit. To not speak out is to be part of the problem and not part of the solution. I think I myself have, have been wrong in the past. I've said, well, you know, Pilates is my area of expertise, so that's what I need to stick with. But no, we cannot say that anymore. So I've said about athletes, really, you know, you're an athlete. That's your area. No, no. Politicians are there to represent us. And if they are not representing us well, if society is not going in the direction that we believe in, then we need to speak up. I, I just this week had a comment of someone that said, I, I really respect your teaching, but, you know, stick to Pilates, <laughs> stay out of politics, stay out of social issues. Well, we are social issues. That's what we are. Yes. And so, uh, you know, we need to take well-being very seriously. Well-being is not only about our own physical health. We believe in Bassi that it's about body, mind, and spirit. We need to take it out to our clients, to our students, to our communities, to our society, to our country, to the world, to the planet. And we need to send these waves out into the world. I know today we are going to speak about the G, the gay community, and I know my one of my favorite people, Ellsworth. Such a pleasure to know Ellsworth. We have known each other for a long time. We've worked together. I have to just again mention our Asian community who are suffering today. And we have to speak out. We cannot be silent because I'm a Pilates teacher. I cannot have a voice. We have to have a voice. Our Asian brothers and sisters are such a valuable, valued part of our community. We love all our Asian brothers and sisters and we need to stand together, stand up and speak out. To be silent is to be complicit. I will now be silent. <laughs> <laughs> the next 10 seconds. Um, in case you haven't noticed, we also had to change sets today. Um, normally, Rail have our, and I have our very intimate set downstairs, but we wanted to expand it because Ellsworth had volunteered to come in. So we're upstairs in our studio. As you can see, we are appropriately distanced. Um, Rail and El have both received their shots. I'm online to get mine. So we are still practicing COVID guidelines, and I wanted to bring that to everybody's attention. And now I just want to take a moment and hear from Al, who I've gotten to know as well over the years with Rail. Um, we've worked on many projects together, and El keeps me right here online. So I'm sure during this conversation, he's also going to keep me right here <laughs> on task. Welcome, Al. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, everybody out there. So, Al, um, we, in the beginning, we always want to talk about definitions. Sure. And I wanted you to explain to us 
the definition. There's also some historical context behind that. Sure. So the floor is yours. The floor is mine. Uh, definitions. For those people who are not a member of the LGBTQIA plus community, um, all of the words and the definitions associated with them can be confusing. And also, if you're not a member of the community, you may feel at what point do I use which word is it appropriate? Um, my suggestion is that at this point, no one should be caught up on the words. The conversation needs to happen. Mm -hmm. If you're a member of the community and you're having the conversation, it's not my place to correct you. If I correct, I'm putting you on the defensive. Mm -hmm. I need to be open to you using the words that are at your disposal to the best of your ability as you're coming to understand the community and the different nuances that the words have. To everybody out there that's not a member of that community, just use the words that you're comfortable with as you have the conversations. They'll start to fall in place and they'll start to make sense, but the words themselves are continuing to open mm -hmm. and be redefined and be refine tuned, which is a little bit of what the plus sign at the end of the conversation uh -huh. has to do with is that there are, as of yet, potentially unidentified groups that are a part of the larger umbrella of sexual orientation and gender minorities. Huge umbrella, sexual orientation and gender minorities. Queer, start there. It's a safe word. If somebody gives you pushback for using that word, that's just because they're not comfortable with the word themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Start wow, with the great. big umbrella and feel safe taking the tears down. But also what those of us who are in the community need to be open to is people perhaps stepping into a conversation that they're not prepared for. And that's fantastic. Appreciate the fact that they're having a conversation. Having a conversation with our clients, having a voice. This week, I've had a client with a mother who, with other adult parents, was trying to figure out the he, she, him, they, I, we vocabulary and how do we implement it appropriately. Interestingly enough, their teenage children were embarrassed by the entire conversation. Please don't use those words. <laughs> and all the parents wanted to do was help us know when using these words and how to use them is the right approach to take. So we, Lonnie, remember Lonnie was saying the of same course. thing. And of Lonnie, course. thank you for joining us again. How are you? Uh, of course. <laughs> I'm so good. How are you guys? Well, you know, Lonnie is a transgender man and uh, such an incredible human being, a wonderful addition to our family. And your tone and his tone are so much the same of just putting us at ease and just saying it's a conversation. Mm -hmm. Don't be scared of screwing up. You know, if you get one letter wrong, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> My friends <laughs> never always, they always, always get it wrong. <laughs> we'll add more to the list. We'll confuse right. you again. So, you know, you put us at ease and that's such a great thing. I mean, I wrote to Lonnie after our conversation and I, I admit it, I, I just felt quite uneducated. And I regarded myself, you know, as someone who's 66 next uh, month, uh, has, you know, a, a, a worldly view on the world. And I just honestly felt quite guilty that I was not educated enough. And uh, Lonnie in his soft, beautiful, humane way said, be easy on yourself, you know, <laughs> <laughs> uh, like many others say to me, just, you know, it's fine. We're all just growing. We're all having a conversation. Correct. So I thank Lonnie and I thank you for, for making us, you know, feel just comfortable to have a conversation. Absolutely. Fire away. Fire Here away. We go. So. Okay. So um, one of the questions that came up in our conversation yes. and um, others have always had is stumbling over how do we identify your life partners? Are they spouses? Are they partners? Are they wives, husbands? How mm -hmm. 
And I know um, a, I just read an article very recently where one woman was um, starting to push back on the word wife because it was more gender job defining and mm -hmm. she felt it very limited. So mm -hmm. she was like, I do not want to be defined as a wife, even though she is in a relate, she's in a, she's a, um, a lesbian, but she says, I don't want my partner to be defined as a wife. I'm not a wife because that leads you down a different constitution of definitions. Mm -hmm. So I'm putting that conversation to On you. To me. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> It's going to be a matter of personal preference. It's as simple as that. I refer to Brad mm -hmm. as my husband. In all of my conversations with people, I use the word husband. I will say this. I am not legally married. We've been together for 19 years. We are not legally married for our own reasons. We do not believe that we need a contract with the state to... Um, define our commitment to one another. And I think that uh, I feel very fortunate that I live in an era where, um, although I want that right for those who want it, I personally don't need it, but I do use the word husband. He uses the word partner. <laughs> it's personal preference awesome. uh, in terms of the that. words that you choose uh -huh. to use. Um, uh, to a certain degree, although I don't choose to be legally married, I think in the back of my mind, I use a uh, husband because in the heterosexual community, mm -hmm. it's husband and wife. Mm -hmm. So I choose to um, present myself with uh, a word that's more familiar to the majority of the population. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But again, if um, when I'm talking to somebody, most of my clients identify Brad as my partner. Mm -hmm. They don't use the word husband. Right. I do. Mm -hmm. And again, it's a conversation. Whatever words are used, we're grownups. Right. We know <laughs> that people don't mean harm yes. in the words that they're choosing. Most to times, use. most times, I think you're giving people a lot of credit. Sorry, I'm <laughs> sounding a little. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just sounding a little pessimistic today. I, I, you know, I, I get really angry with things that are going on, and I am. I'm feeling, um, you know, I, I'm feeling a, a sense of, of despair, anger, desperation, because I get up very early in the morning, and I probably shouldn't turn on the TV. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm watching at night, and, and you know, it, it's, it's not good. But I want to ask you, El. Do you feel we've come a long way or not? Because, you know, when I see one of my favorite people, one of my favorite politicians, Pete Buttigieg, uh, as a cabinet member, part of the government, he's an openly gay man. A, yes. A, a presidential candidate. Yes. I, I absolutely adore the guy, you know. I'm inspired by him. We had a conversation this morning. Yasmin was on the conversation and uh, I was asked who inspires me. I, I didn't mention Pete, but he is one of those people that inspire me. So then I'm so encouraged. Wow, look at this, an openly gay man and, and his husband, uh, um, what's his name again? Chaston. Uh, Chaston. I mean, just such a, a beautiful couple. So I feel we've come a long way, but in some ways, I feel that America is light years behind. I, I really do uh, in in social acceptance of the gay community. So I, I want you to tell me. Put, yeah. put me in my place. Just <laughs> open the curtain. Okay. Tell me. Um, uh, as far as we've gone forward, there is as much pushback. Right. There will always be. For every step forward, there will be pushback. For every new um, avenue that's opened, there will be pushback. What do we choose to pay attention to? And what is a light shown on that kind of makes us feel like, are we really? In America, by and large, yes, we've made a lot of progress. But within our community, it is still against the law and punishable by death in multiple countries on the planet. So when we say we, I'm gonna say we in America, sure, we've made progress, 
but for the progress that we make, I don't doubt for a second that a conservative justice is coming after my ability to adopt. Not for a hot second. They're going to chip away at that first. And then when they've chipped away at that, they're going to go back and they're going to chip away at the right to marry, which the House has already had a conversation with. When they try to take the right away, we will go and get married to prove the point, right. to be among the counted. But it, it's a tug of war. And I think that it constantly will be. I'm terrified by the way that our government is choosing to legislate against transgender. Mm -hmm. Because I think that they're legislating against that category without knowing the definition of transgender. Mm -hmm. Transgender does not have to do with sexual orientation. Therefore, your traditional Catholic it's a sin concept that we hear from some political people has no water. Right. Mm. It doesn't fit. So you're going to have to do a better job about telling me just exactly what it is that you're afraid of, because I also don't believe for a hot second that those people care the least in making female sports safe. No, no. By legislating against transgender females from participating in sports at the middle school, high school, and college level. Show me mm -hmm. the statistics where someone has been advantaged and someone lost a championship because. Yeah. I don't believe doesn't it for a exist. second. It doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. I, 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 I cited some research, so, uh, yeah. research last time. And no, it doesn't exist. You're absolutely correct. So have we made progress? Yes. For every step we take forward, is there gonna be pushback? Yes. Should we be angry? Yes. <laughs> Great. I, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because, be angry real, so. <laughs> because I grew up um, under the umbrella of the AIDS epidemic. Yeah. And in the beginning of that epidemic, there were two groups. There was the group that said, we're only going to make progress through normalcy. And then there was act up, fight back. Mm -hmm. Two groups, two different thoughts. The only way that we're gonna make progress is being angry and fighting. Mm -hmm. Then there were others, the only way that we're gonna make progress is through patience and time and statistical steps forward in legislation. I believe that Pete, is the slow and steady version. Yeah, yeah. I don't believe that his approach is going to be um, anger fight. No. But the fight is necessary, as is the balanced, patient, statistical, mm -hmm. logical approach. Both are necessary. Both are necessary. Yes, I agree. Um, you know, I, I, I think the civil rights movement is such a great example because there has been progress. There has been progress. And obviously we think of that slow, methodical, embracing, uh, change minds approach of, you know, Martin Luther King and, mm -hmm. and you know, uh, the greats of the civil rights movement and the change that was brought about. But yet again, there's such pushback today, mm -hmm. more pushback today possibly than the last, yeah. you know, 50 years. Uh, so, sure, uh, because it, it can happen faster and it can be an instant. It can be a soundbite that can reach hundreds of millions of people in a second. And they'll willingly absorb the soundbite as the pushback and unfortunately perhaps uh, um, allow a, a, a canned soundbite to impact their perspective and their point of view. Maybe things are going too quickly. Maybe we are getting a little bit too liberal. Mm -hmm. Maybe we should be a little bit more conservative in our thinking. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting. Uh, do you think there's anyone out in the audience that has a question? I know we've been uh, hogging the conversation, <laughs> but if anyone has a question, what I'm going to suggest is is unmute and ask the question. That's how we've been doing it in my classes. It's been working well. If it becomes chaotic, then we'll uh, 
change, but uh, uh, for now, if anyone has a comment, please unmute and ask the question or comment. Candice, do we have anything? As of now, no question. Yeah, great to see your familiar faces. <laughs> great. Thank you, Bassie, for hosting this. So, you know, I, I'm going to uh, put out and, and you know, uh, El, the conversations that we've been having have been true conversations to educate each other. And uh, I'd like to know when in your life did you discover that you were gay? Um, so I was identified clearly by everyone else on the play playground as early as the first, second, and third grade as he's a fag, he's queer, he's gay. Now, I was not, sus well, I should, I should have been suspicious because I'm gonna confess something. My family nickname, I'm the youngest of six kids. There was a lot of teasing. My nickname given to me my, by my brothers was Sugar Plum Fairy. Oh, <laughs> it should have been, it it should have been, been a bit of Maybe if I thought differently about why people are gay, I would blame my brothers for how I am. But uh, that's a you know another story for another place. Um, uh, by the time I got to we'll say middle school puberty, uh, I knew that there were some uh, why am why is my I following that person. Why? Why? Mm -hmm. Why is my attention over here and my attention over there? Um, in high school, uh, for, in 10th grade, I did, in fact, have girlfriends. And that was it. That was the end uh, in terms of uh, ever dating women. Um, so putting a name to it or a word to it and beginning to accept it did not happen until I was 18. I was out of high school and I was uh, essentially, I felt like I could, I was, I was at that point where I was up against it. Um, it was uh, kind of a, either I can't handle how the world is or I need to get okay with what I am. So I started to act out because the um, frustration and the depression and the anger had gotten to the point where it was either suicide or go. Mm. Well, no. so the the acting out was 18, mm -hmm. post high school. Right, right. And then did you come out to your family and uh, was, that, so, was that coming out? Yeah, no, that, that was not coming No, my God. <laughs> No, no, <laughs> because there's a process that has to occur with the person um, uh, coming to terms with themselves, I believe, first. Uh, it's not like, boom, decision, boom, talk to family, ta-da, everything's, it just doesn't happen that way. Um, so no, because 18, uh, for two years, 18 and 19, I acted out, I explored, 20, 21, 22, 100% celibate, AIDS crisis. I was sure that I was going to die because that's what we were told based upon my promiscuous behavior at 18 and 19. Right. At the time, we were also told, Dr. Fauci, by the way, that the virus potentially could exist in us for up to three years prior to manifesting any symptoms. Hence, three years of celibacy. That put me, technically, 21, 22, before I started participating in gay life again in the gay community. Mm -hmm. And from there, it was, first, it wasn't family. It was conversation with friends, friends that I had had all the way through high school and through college. Who were heterosexual friends. Heterosexual friends. 100% of them turned and walked away. Wow. You got to be kidding me. Nope. Whoa. And if that doesn't put you back on your heels and make you reassess, whoa, I thought that 
those people were the people that were going to accept. Mm -hmm. If that doesn't make you rethink having the conversation with your family, you know, so the conversation I had in my head about how to address this with my family went on for a long time. Ultimately, I formally came out to each of my siblings, but the conversation wasn't about me being gay. The conversation was, of course, you know that I get, I'm gay. The conversation is, how do we handle it with mom and dad? Mm. Wow. And how did your mom and dad take it? Completely um, non-typical. I never, never formally addressed the words with my parents. Never. I just lived my life. I brought home who I brought home and whoever I brought home was invited to the birthdays and the Christmases and the weddings. And there were always gifts under the tree. And then some of those, you know, obviously that person went away and someone new came and then that person went away and someone new came. But I didn't ever bring anybody around the family that I wasn't dead serious about. Right. But I just lived my life. And never spoke about I it. I never used the words. I was just me. And they, and they never addressed it. No, no. because yes. I was just me. The words were never necessary. I just lived my life. And did that give you like a new sense of confidence and security? Um, it, it, it gave me the sense that no matter what, I knew that my parents um, loved me and were proud of me mm -hmm. and that the words were not necessary. Your deeds and your actions are what's what, or what matters. Right. Right. And that's the way that I chose to go about it. But that was the household I grew up in. Mm -hmm. Deeds and actions matter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where did you grow up? Was it uh, I, I, I'm a, a native Californian. I'm a third generation Californian uh, in the San Fernando Valley and the uh, west side of Los Angeles. I've lived there my entire life. Mm -hmm. in, the, in the area of West Los Angeles that I live in now, I've lived in that pocket for 25 years. Wow. I'm the official gay mayor of West LA <laughs> <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> Because I've been there longer than anybody else. <laughs> and that brings me to another comment, because um, you had mentioned that uh, the difference between the, what you would say, the old guard and the new yes. guard mm -hmm. is not knowing the history mm -hmm. of where they are, how they got there, what shoulders were wrote, they writing yeah. on. Yeah. And that's really important. Yeah. But I think also for the rest of us, we don't know what shoulders we're riding on, you were riding on either. So I know it started, I, the big thing that I remember is the Stonewall, I believe. Correct, 69. Yes, and then... Boom, 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 it happens from there. Um, so if the Stonewall uh, demonstrations, riots, whatever you choose to call them, occurred in 1969, mm -hmm. the very next summer, in Christopher Park, which is immediately adjacent to where the Stonewall Bar well, was, uh -huh. uh, they had the what is known in American history as the first gay pride festival or parade or event. So 1970 marks that particular stamp in time. Mm -hmm. um, now, 1974, it took until 1974 for the Psychi Psychiatric Society of America to take homosexuality off of the books as a mental disorder. Mm. 1974, where were you in 1974? Yes. Yeah. Where yeah, were you I in was, 1974? Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. It took that long. Oh, yeah. So, you know, it wasn't like, boom, stuff started happening right away. I was in the army. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that until that point, uh, generally speaking, clinically speaking, they still considered homosexuality as a, a mental disorder until 1974. And we, you know, fast forward the next decade, 1980s, 80s, uh, that particular decade was the AIDS crisis. Mm -hmm. That was the next, that was a big marker in my life because it was during the period of time that I was coming out and coming to terms with who I am. So that everything that occurred in that period of 
time in the Ronald Reagan administration and how we, the community was treated by that particular administration was a huge marker on me and the level of activism that's required and to what degree you can trust your government mm. or perhaps be afraid of your government mm -hmm. or not feel like the government is in fact representative of all. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. Well, you know, something you said earlier, and, and it struck me because we spoke to Lani uh, about when he told his parents and mm -hmm. his friends, and he was actually speaking about, uh, and Lani, if I'm uh, distorting anything, just feel free to jump in. Uh, but his friends, he had the opposite experience. Lani, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, he had the opposite experience. His friends were and remain incredibly supportive. Mm -hmm. And this is where I think there possibly has been a change. Huge because change. Because I know Ilan, our son, you know, just come on one night and said, you know, one of his friends is bisexual. And it was just, you know, it was just part of dinner. And could you pass the bread? And, uh, you know, he just, he didn't, it, it wasn't be, even it, something that, it, it was just, you know, just like he would say, you know, so-and-so's got a boyfriend, so-and-so's got a girlfriend. And he said, so-and-so is bisexual. And, um, you know, and it, it made me so happy and made Adele so happy that it's, it's, it's just not unusual. It's, it's just part of being. Correct. And, and that's where I think there has been like a grassroots change that today Correct. It, it's seen so differently Correct. by the youth. Correct. And um, what the grown-ups in the room need to do is watch the example. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Just watch the example and just let you become the example that they are. Right, right. Question. Hey, y'all. Karen from Virginia. Um, hey. So do you think that's because we're just getting more accepting or more humane as, as a society? Or do you think it's more that we're learning from the young younger generations and kids? I mean, I have an 11-year-old, and, I mean, she thinks nothing of it. We um, we had two friends. Uh, she uh, the word lesbian came up in conversation. She's like, "What what is that about this lesbian thing?" I said, "Oh, I said, well, you know, we have so and so Grayson has two dads, right?" She's like, "Yeah." I said, two moms, same kind of thing." She's like, "Oh, okay, Whoop, gone, moved on." So it's so it's it's almost so much so mainstream to them. You just explain it, and they're like, "Yeah, whatever." I mean, it doesn't doesn't phase them. Don't blink. They're just like. It's, it's like a big vocabulary word is like the big mystery. As soon as you go what it is, you're like, oh, like so-and-so. I'm like, yep, yeah, exactly. And off they go. So do you think we're just getting smarter or the kids are just better? Um, I, I think that it's a combination of both. I think that um, uh, as kids bring up the questions, I think uh, more uh, up-to-date or more modern parents know that the inflection with which they answer the question is going to be the trigger to the child, whether it's pejorative and negative and something to be suspicious of versus it just, it's just like any, it's just so, it's just so, it's like anything else. So um, I have to take my hat off to uh, people out there who are currently parenting the youth in terms of how they're handling the answer of the question. Mm -hmm. um, because it is in the answering of the question that the stigma is diminished and the mystery is diminished and it's just even and level, just like everything else. Right, right. There's no hysteria where if I, back in 1974, had, you know, like, mom, what's this lesbian thing? We don't use those words. We don't talk about those things in this house. It would have been the answer. Wow. Yes, it's true as it was in my house. Correct. Yeah. And it, was, it, it would have been the way that the parent answered the question that the child would have immediately understood, oh, I said something I shouldn't have. Mm -hmm. I talked about something I shouldn't have. It's a negative. It's a bad. It's, you know, it's, so it's, it's, it's in the answering that I think that um, uh, things have become more uh, accepted. At, again, more accepted. 
<laughs> I'm going to qualify that. We're lucky where we live in America because there are a lot of places where it's dangerous. Absolutely. You know, I, I remember uh, a little story. Um, uh, you know, I grew up in South Africa and, and my mom worked with mentally challenged uh, kids and uh, adults since I can remember. And I must have been home from school for some reason, but she took me to work with her one day and she's a speech therapist. And probably one of the most compassionate empathetic, beautiful people I've ever met. Uh, she uh, and my dad, tremendous inspirations, the greatest inspirations in my life. And I remember her treating someone. And I, I choke up a little when I think of it now, I, I, just the circumstance thinking of her. But as he walked out, uh, he was clearly very mentally uh, challenged, very physically and mentally. And she said, you know what happened to that man? And I was probably about five or six. And she said, he was beaten up by the police because he is homosexual. And she tried to explain it to me at that age, very tender age, but how terrible that is and how every person deserves dignity. And she was so, um, you know, just so beautiful and empathetic with this man. But so it's in our lifetime that those things happen, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. so close to me to see this, this guy whose life was ruined because of ignorant, just ignorant, cruel people. So I think, you know, we've come a long way, but we were going to assign a faculty member just recently to an assignment mm -hmm. and a gay member of our faculty called us and said, you cannot send a gay man to that country because there is still a death penalty there. Correct. So if any of us go there, uh, we could be taken to prison and they have a death penalty for gay men. So, you know, obviously, please don't send anyone yeah. who is gay. Yeah. So, you know, uh, I mean, it, it really does make us feel very fortunate in a way, but we realize how far we still need to go. But in terms of how far we still need to go, as uh, the fortunate ones, we need to continue to push so that those that are out there that are still in desperate need of our assistance in countries where it is illegal still and punishable by death, that at some point they hear our voices and they know that we're out here uh, rooting for them and trying to make progress for them. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, some questions for you, Mr. Pasquale. Sure. Um, so, uh, Question was, yes, this asked me, um, can you talk about your Pilates career? How did you get into Pilates, back to Pilates specifically? And uh, did you feel accepted in your orientation to the Pilates teaching process? Sure. Um, I'll try to make this story uh, short and, and quick. Um, uh, they know this particular story. There was only one career I ever wanted, and I wanted to be a rock star. <laughs> <laughs> However, the only musical instrument I know how to play is the bagpipes. That does not make for a rock star. So I, I, my degree is actually in uh, architecture, but I discovered along the way, pursuing that particular career, that it's a lot of math. This brain is not designed for engineering and math that goes along with architecture. So uh, I ended up with an 18-year career in retail, in store design which is where the gay came in. <laughs> and after 18 years of doing that, I actually thought I've been on my feet too long. I need to sit down. I made the horrible mistake of transitioning out of 18 years of store design in retail to the mortgage industry just before it collapsed in 2018. <laughs> and I needed a job and I needed a job in a hot minute. 
I did a Google search and the first search that came up was Bassy. Wow. Hey, you were number one. Look at that. Yeah, yeah look at that. <laughs> Marketing team. <laughs> right? <laughs> so uh, I called the phone number and a woman by the name of Jean King answered the phone. I had an incredible conversation with Jean about the training program because what I was actually interested in was a training program in a school run by a man if I was going to do Pilates. Mm. Wow. So there was a course that was starting in two weeks. I had never done Pilates before in my life. A training course was starting in two weeks. Jean hooked me up with another Bassey certified instructor. I went, I did an hour session. At the end of the session, I said to the instructor, do I have it or do I not have it? They said, why are you asking? I said, I'm about to start school. Should I or not? She said, do it. <laughs> wow. And I never looked back. So now in the workplace, mind you, this is my third career. So all of the bumps and the grinds along the way that occurred because of me being gay occurred in my earlier career positions. I have never, ever not been 100% authentic, either here in class or with my clients as who I am. Never not. It's why I believe I'm successful and it's, I believe, why my clients have been with me for nearly 15 years. It's because I've always just been true to who I am mm -hmm. and allowing them to be true to who they are as clients. And we get on with the instruction. Right. I have a question. Sure. Do you find that because you're gay, do you find that you get a lot of gay clients? Absolutely zero. That's what I want. <laughs> it's interesting. Yeah, I, I, you, I think you made a mistake with a year. I think you say 2018 or did you say 2008? Two, uh, 2000 and uh, two, uh, 2016, 17, 18 is the mortgage collapse. No, but when you started Pilates, Immediately after that mortgage collapse, because it was the mortgage collapse that led me to seeking a career as a Pilates instructor. No, Al, you've got the dates all me. So you're, <laughs> you're talking about 2008. Oh, I am I'm talking about 18. I told like, you I wasn't good at numbers. <laughs> <laughs> you're horrible at numbers. <laughs> Welcome to my world with him. Yes. Yeah. No, 2008. 2008. Yes. Because I, why I remember it so well, why I remember it so well, because you, I, I've never, in all these years, I've never told you this, but Jean, yeah, I was living up in Oregon at the time. Really? Yeah. Okay. And and Jean called me and she said, I've just spoken to a guy. You are going to love him. You're going to love him. And she either called me or I was coming down here to teach. And But she told me all about you. She was so excited. And then, of course, I met you. And then I did love you. I do love you. And... Uh, <laughs> Um, Are you having a, a bisexual panic moment? <laughs> oh, you know, I've always envied. I've always said to you, you always look so well put together. <laughs> as hard as I try, I leave the house. I say to Adele, do I look good? I look good until you arrive. <laughs> and then I think, oh, come on. I'm usually Just, like fixing his collar. Or, yeah, like pulling his straight. Summer, never quite make it. But um, yes, I mean, I'm going to add from my perspective, because uh, I've known Ellsworth as a student, but even more as someone that I've invited to be part of photo shoots, it is very rare to find someone who can go the distance in a photo shoot with me. <laughs> and, uh, you know, keep the stamina, keep the focus, keep the patience, Keep the precision. I mean, it is nothing but a pleasure to work with you. In fact, I just uh, acknowledged you in my book, my third edition of my book that will wow. be coming out. And uh, absolutely, you are just an incredible person to work with. Uh, and that's what it comes down to. It just comes down to the human being, you know, knowing who is committed, who is dedicated, who is on the same path, the same vision. So uh, Jean was right. 
Uh, Gene and I had many arguments, but on that one, <laughs> <laughs> on that one, we have not argued. We uh, we both. Uh, she knew I would absolutely adore you, and I have. And I I did not know that you also wanted to be a rock star, though. Mm. And I wanted to be a rock star. Uh-huh. So <laughs> I knew that. I knew that part of the story. <laughs> so Rail, you've been um, commended for your elephant-like memory on the chat. <laughs> I do. Uh, yes. He doesn't forget anything. He has a memory like an elephant. <laughs> yes, that is true. I do have a good memory. Certainly, uh, long-term memory. I remember things. Uh, I, I I literally remember it like yesterday. Gene saying to me, uh, "Did you leave a letter in my office?" I I, I, I um uh the second time I did the entire entire comprehensive uh session. I left letters for you and for That's Stella right. and for the other faculty members that had participated. That's right. I remember that letter, beautiful letter. And uh, yeah, absolutely. I remember it like yesterday, really, Jean speaking to me about you. And, uh, you know, it really, you're just a special person. And, um, you know, I mean, hundreds of students go through and uh, it's, it's, it's it, we've, we've been together a long time mm-hmm. and, yeah. and you're about to do the honors program. I'm about to finish. Yes. Yeah. So uh, Ellsworth will be one of really, uh, there will be now four classes, five classes. No, no this, this will be the third. Thing. So this is only the third. Okay. So they uh, say about 50 in the world that have completed the whole legacy program. And um, you know, it, it, it's the numbers, I want to keep them select because it's a select group of people. And I'm terrified. Oh, no. no. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. A few people wanted to interview Ellsworth. They said, I never look back either regarding Bassey. You are awesome. Bravo for being you. Bravo for being you. Bravo for being me. Yes and yes. And that is one of the things that Rail always talks about is being your authentic self and doing these conversations and other things that we've been involved in. That's been coming up over and over again. We love the authenticity of Bassey. So it apparently Mm -hmm. comes from the top down and sprinkles out all around. It does come from the top down because all of the faculty members that I have ever worked with as a student, they were all very clear. This is the repertoire, this is the information, but you apply yourself, your unique individual self to the work and the teaching. Mm-hmm. Every I, single I think one that, of that, that makes Bassey so unique, honestly, because, and, and I've always said that, I want the repertoire to be mm-hmm. very precise, but how you convey it, keep your own personality, don't lose your personality. Uh, don't become a cookie cutter teacher. Be be you. Be the best version of you. You are the best version of you that could ever be. So uh, you know, I, I strongly believe that. Yes. Um, as a commend to the beautiful process of being a Bassy instructor, um, a question from Joey says: How do you navigate the male versus female dichotomy of the Pilates practitioners? The queer community appears underrepresented in this field, and how do you feel about that? Um, I'll just add that's from Joey, just a great man on the chat with us. Uh, one of our very valued, valued members <laughs> of our community. Yes. Um, uh, I haven't, uh, I have always entered a room knowing that as a man, I was going to be a minority. Um, but I still, in the back of my mind, always remember Joseph, man created it initially for men, okay? So I kind of feel like I'm just holding my place in the history of Pilates as a a male practitioner. But as an instructor and a practitioner, there isn't gay or straight, it's just Pilates. Mm. Uh, I am authentically myself and occasionally issues relevant to the community do come up in conversation because, as Rail said, we must have the conversation. I take it upon myself to elevate the conversation of my clients if the topics come up rather than, you know, kind of not having Mm. conversations. Uh, All subjects are uh, on the table and open for discussion. Um, But... uh, 
I haven't ever experienced any form of pushback at all. I'm aware that I'm a minority as a male, but I don't necessarily see it as an advantage or a disadvantage. Again, I'm strictly focused on filling my space in the room. Mm -hmm. Do you have instructors that work uh, for you, with you? Um, uh, no, uh, uh, just so everybody knows, um, I work exclusively in a chiropractic office as a Pilates instructor, facilitating Pilates for the doctor's patients. Okay. So um, I tend to work in a fairly um, rehabilitative environment rather than a exercise environment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where, where is Joey? Uh, Joey, could you just chime in where, where you're teaching now, what you're doing now? I, I haven't seen you in so long, so I, I want to catch up. He has a vibrant Instagram following. Oh, really? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Rail. Hi, everyone. Hi, Joey. We miss um, you. What's the deal? Where are you? Um, here, quarantined, waiting to return back. Uh, <laughs> but I mean... Yeah, I'm, I'm excited that things are starting to open up. I'm going to keep this short, um, teaching at, for Club Pilates, but also starting um, a pre-Pilates certification program at uh, at one of the dance conservatories over in the Inland Empire, where they work, uh, juniors and seniors work to do some of the foundational mat repertoire, and then they continue on over at Riverside City College to... Um, to continue the work with um, Kelly Kelly Lamo, I don't know how to pronounce her last name, but she's also a, a Bassi graduate. So we're kind of uh, collaborating right now. Joey, I'm listening to every word. My computer was about to run out of juice, so I didn't want you to be cut off in the middle. <laughs> so, so yeah, that, that's that's my current story right now. <laughs> <laughs> Great, but it's great to see you, Joey. Great to hear from you. There we go. I'm just going to put on gallery. Yeah. Uh, so let's open it up to the to the group. <laughs> to right. the group. I have a, a comment from the live chat on the Instagram saying it's so refreshing to hear you bring your own personality to the table as a Pilates instructor and a good in your life. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, more people are typing here. Let's see what's going on. So, when, while the questions are coming in, sure. Uh, when when am I going to meet Brad? Because uh, <laughs> I've met Brad. You uh, met Brad. Stella has actually been in my home, and his home. I told him when I get my home, he and they're decorating my house. Oh my gosh! Yeah, really? Yes. Yeah. Well, I, I thought it would be you. I'm sorry. It's going to be okay. Well, you did, in this particular you just circumstance, you just insulted me. Your job may not survive today. <laughs> um, in that particular category, it's the gay thing. <laughs> it's what gorgeous. You mean uh, design? Oh, well, you would love his home. Uh, really? I, look, I can, I can believe it. I can imagine. Uh, but... You know, I just love to meet Brad. You know, he's is is part of your life, and uh, I it, I did mention it before. You absolutely uh, before did. Before the learn from the leader, you absolutely I did. Absolutely, absolutely did. Absolutely did. Hundred uh, percent. Uh, yeah. But anyway, I just uh, put it out there again. <laughs> put it out there again. A little more public this time. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. there's no going. Back. That's correct, and I'll take it home again. <laughs> Good. But he's an amazing. Yeah. I did send Latoya a picture of the two of us, so so that um he does exist. Oh no! I absolutely believe it. <laughs> I just uh, when it, I always like meeting the the, the families, the, the the husbands, the wives, the families. I spoke about that in an interview this morning. That I think what gives uh, Bassie such a family feel is uh, personally, I'm really interested in being a part of people's families mm -hmm. and and seeing people's, you know, husbands, wives, partners kids yeah you know, I've seen so many of them grow up so um anyway I just yes. thought I'd put it out there Next <laughs> okay question. yeah all right so a question from Latoya she asked what is standing in the way of progression marginalized communities is it us as a society or are the civil servants quote politicians preventing policy from changing up to where we are uh, I think Great it's the question. I think it's the latter. I think it's the latter, and this is why I think it's the latter. 
I think that at 56, I'm old enough now to kind of see how legislation works uh, from the American experiment. Mm -hmm. And in our country, we tend to legislate from the negative. Mm -hmm. Don't do this. Don't behave that way. Penalty, penalizing. We're not a society that legislates and creates law as a form of reward. If you're a good person and you pay your taxes on time, next year your tax base is going to go down 0.5%. And if you do it every year thereafter, your tax basis is going to continue to go down because you're a good citizen. We don't legislate that way. Mm. We legislate from fear and penalty. So I'm going to say as a society, as an experiment, we, and I hope the younger generation can do this, need to take a look at how we look at things. Mm -hmm. Rather than the don't behaviors, we should be looking at it the other way, reward the good. The good behaviors, yeah. And let the good rise to the top and let society succeed from that perspective rather than get in line, mm -hmm. behave, mm -hmm. do it this way. But that's why I can't run for politics, because I would be completely <laughs> coming yeah, at it from the wrong approach. I love that. Thank well, it may be coming at it from the right approach. Yeah. As far as I'm concerned. Right. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Um, I have a question, personally, actually. What do you bring to the table as a Pilates instructor, and what do you want your clients to leave with after every session? Um, I want them to be as authentic as I am in, in their lives and their selves. But here's, the, uh, here's one of the ways that um, I approach uh, Pilates personally. The client might come to me and they're kind of living with their body. The aches and the pains and, you know, it's nuances. I attempt to transition them to living in their body, aware of it, intelligent, informed, it might still ache, there might be pains to living through their body, going beyond the living with it, to the understanding of it, to using the physical being that we were given as humans and live life through your body. That's my approach to um, Pilates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I have a similar approach. I probably word it differently, uh, uh, but I, I think it equates to the same thing that, uh, you know, we all have our aches and pains, but I don't, and I encourage people not to become their ache and pain, mm -hmm. not to be identified by their ache and pain. As Guadalupe, um, mm -hmm. a dear friend of mine, I'm going to be giving a workshop next in May, uh, called The Power of Aging, and we were talking about it, and she's such an inspiration to me. Um, and she, she said a sentence that, that really struck a chord with me, and she said, we are more than our bodies. And, you know, she, don't, don't be defined by an ache, a pain. Mm -hmm. a, yes, it's bothersome, but live your life mm -hmm. through your body, beyond your body, and not by these aches and pains. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, More questions. I see. Let's yeah, bring it yeah. in. We don't got this beautiful group <laughs> of people on the screen yet, and let's get questions. Yes, yes. Feel free to unmute, and if you want to ask your question yourself, you are more than welcome to simply unmute and speak on. Wow. Okay. Okay. Uh, do you have more questions as our host and I, moderator? <laughs> yes. I, I, I was kind of letting you guys just run the boat, but um, I do because we, I want it to go over, you touched on a lot of things as far as legislation. Sure. And there's a lot of legislation going through. Correct. That is, some is going forward and a lot of it is going backwards. Yes. Um, you mentioned the one about the adoptions. Yes. And there's another one that's actually in the Supreme Court right now, I think that is looking at um, the status of how to redefine who gets benefits from employees that sure. are partnering. Of course. And I wanted to know if you wanted to speak to that because that's another chunk. <laughs> That's happening. <laughs> um, I'm going to I'm going to say it in a particular way. If you are a member of the LGBTQIA plus community, 
and you are find yourself in an employee or in, you know situation where uh, your uh, partner or not may be included in uh, the insurance benefits, take it and participate in it. The only way that we're going to continue to expand those rights is if we're active and counted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In America, numbers matter. Mm -hmm. And unless there's visibility and unless you participate and you check the box that identifies you as a member of a minority group, unless you take that step, no progress can be made. Unfortunately, it's the nature of the system. Mm -hmm. Um, so check the box, be uh, counted. Yeah. Are, they, are you thinking of adopting? Uh, uh, no, um, uh, Brad and I, uh, uh, based upon where we are in our lives, we're, we're both very, very clear that we are not parents. Um, uh, again, uh, I mentioned before, I'm the youngest of six. Of the six of us, four clearly parents, two of us, clearly not parents. Mm -hmm. And, um, and with as many nieces and nephews and grand nieces and nephews as I've had running around my whole life, I don't, uh, you know. But you have a fur baby. Well, yes, but that fur baby passed. Oh, I'm That's so okay. sorry. It's all right, it's okay. I did, I, I, Stella was mentioning that I have a fur baby. Yes, uh, Godzilla. Uh, was uh, <laughs> I, I, I had a, a pet child? Yes. That thought it was human. Yes. Not a dog. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. I've got one of those. Yeah. Oh. Runs at home. Yeah. 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 So um... now uh, uh, I'm going to jump in. Okay. I'm going to make a recommendation to um, uh, everybody out there listening. Everybody knows about TED Talks. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give you a title homosexuality it's about survival not sex homosexuality period it's about survival dash not sex wow. it's a conversation about where the current scientific research and studies are headed and what they currently think about why mm -hmm. Uh, 17, 17 minutes and it's gonna blow your mind wow yeah well i love ted talks and that's one i'll definitely watch i'm i know adele's on the conversation and we'll watch that together for sure yeah uh Lani gave us homework as well and uh we've <laughs> thoroughly enjoyed Lani's <laughs> homework so i regard this as my homework and we'll give homework assignments we want everyone to uh keep the conversation homework. alive yes absolutely <laughs> so um you repeat that one time homosexuality mm -hmm. it's about survival not sex yeah, she's putting in the chat for everyone. That's awesome. Great. Well, uh, an amazing hour. Uh, Stella, you're so a wonderful fast. moderator. Thank you. Al, uh, Thanks I really, for inviting me down to Newport you, Beach. You, it's so great <laughs> seeing you. You're uh, really, you're just a treasured person, uh, uh, so, someone I really value. And I'm so uh, happy that you are going to be the recipient of our legacy program certificate. Me too. <laughs> a long time coming. And long, you know it's what? Hard work, I, hard work. I take it very seriously, and yeah, I've absolutely. put in my twenty-five thousand hours of instruction, and uh, um, uh, I've worked for it, and I feel like I'm ready for it. Terrified as I might be, but um, I feel like I've approached it from a very serious. Uh, perspective that you would appreciate uh, yeah. in terms of uh, how a student should uh, approach work. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why I truly appreciate it and uh, respect it. And um, uh, every one of these on these legacy graduates has been amazing. You know, it, it's been a wonderful program. And I'm so happy that you're going to be in this next group. Man, just a few thanks to you. Oh, thank Mr. you back. Well, they're saying thank you for sharing your life, heart, and hardship with us. You are loved. Thank you. Thank you for keeping me awake here in Greece from Alexandra. Wow. Hey, Alexandra. Alexandra. Hey. My husband 
is Greek. Your husband <laughs> is Greek. My husband is Greek and Spaniard. He's 50-50. Wow. wow. <laughs> well, you know, our Greek family is, uh, I mean, they're incredible. Look at Alexander, that beautiful Greek princess on the screen right there. Yes. She has yet to miss one of our conversations. She's, She's incredible. made every one of them. Yes. She's amazing, amazing, yes. amazing. Margie sends her love. She is the first comment I said, sharing your love, light, and heart with us. Um, Yasmin says, thank you. You're an amazing person. With all the exclamation <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> uh, Our Maddie from Instagram thanks you all for letting Bassie redo her experience at Pilates school. As she was worried, she had to relearn everything all again, but it's, she's encouraged by the conversation being able to bring her individuality to her teaching. So she thanks you. Great. So Thank I'm going to do some housekeeping real quick. Yes, housekeeping. Sure. All right. So these are um, some things. Thank you to the marketing team. We have all of our conversations up on our YouTube channel. So if you missed any, want to revisit them, they are available. I will also be sending out the link for today's in case you missed it or want to revisit any of the conversation. And then stay tuned for our next one. Rail and I have several topics in line. Um, one about gun control, one about the cancel culture that's happening, um, one about religions and misinformation. We're just trying to line up our guests for this. Those are some light subjects. <laughs> 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 now you know my mood. <laughs> wow. Yeah, so we've got some really, I mean, we're taking this head on. Yeah. Head on. These are the conversations that we need to have. We are taking on life, life itself. So stay tuned for those. And for everyone that's attended, thank you so much. We appreciate your time. We appreciate your contribution to these conversations. If you think of any other topics that you want Rail and I to bring to the forefront, feel free and let us know. And thank you again, everybody. Have a great March, April. April. It's April. <laughs> Bye. Good night, everyone.